Well, welcome to another Friday night. We're looking at a deeper study of the 60 characteristics of complex trauma, the things that people did to cope and survive in dangerous situations now in adult life are not working. They're causing problems. And that's what the 60 characteristics are, all the old coping things and the consequences of it that are now making life painful today. And today we're coming to a key characteristic that comes out of complex trauma, which is the fear of being a burden or a pain. The fear of being annoying because you have needs. In a healthy home, what happens is the understanding is there that your needs are just as important as my needs. We're, one's not better than the other. We're both equal. And so we are going to learn how to love each other in a way that your needs get met and my needs get met. Sometimes, though, I will have to sacrifice my needs in order to meet your needs, and sometimes you'll sacrifice your needs to meet mine, but overall, it'll be equal still. There might be times where I have to sacrifice for an extended period of time, and I'm willing to accept that, so you would get that with a brand new child. They, you sacrifice, sacrifice, they take, they take, but eventually they grow up and are able to get back. Or if there's someone who has major health problems, you sacrifice for an extended period of time, but for the most part, the family is about meeting each other's needs. So that's a healthy home. But what happens in complex trauma <clears throat> is very different. Complex trauma always will have somebody in the leadership position who abuses authority, who has narcissistic tendencies, who's a narcissist. And so when a narcissist has a family, a child, at first they're very excited because they want to show this child off, because it creates these warm feelings inside of them. They feel love, and they love getting hugged by the child. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But after a while, this child, their needs don't go away. They have lots of needs. They need time. They need attention. They need the parent to make sacrifices, to go without sleep sometimes. And to a narcissist, they don't like that. That's cramping their style. That's keeping them from getting, having everything the way they want it. They like it. And so sadly, what can happen in many homes is that the narcissist distorts reality and says to the child, you're being selfish for having needs. Instead of admitting that they, the parent, are being selfish and not wanting to sacrifice, they twist it and tell the child, you're being selfish. And so the child begins to get the message that they're a burden, that they're making life inconvenient for the people caring for them. And so they begin to develop this shame. I don't like feeling like I'm making everybody else's life miserable. That must mean I'm a terrible person. And so it begins to do a lot of damage because the child is always feeling that they're a burden. Sometimes the, the parent will say to them, stop being selfish. Sometimes the parent will do other things. And we'll come to that in just a bit. So let me give you 18 questions, a little test, to see if you have the characteristics of a person who sees themselves as potentially being a burden or who's afraid of being a burden to others. So, number one, you find it very hard to ask for help. Number two, you're afraid that you'll inconvenience people if you ask them for help. Three, you're afraid to burden people with your problems. You're afraid to put too much on people who are already busy and have their own situations to deal with. Number five, you think that everyone is just too busy for you or they all have their own problems, they just don't have time for me. You don't think you are a priority or you're worthy of other people's time or energy. You're not that valuable 
Or you never want to be too much for people because they might abandon you if they find you're just too much. Or some go to this, you are afraid to look weak or to look dependent or to look needy. That would be a terrible thing to reveal. Or some go this way, I am proud, I am a strong, independent person. And you pride yourself on how self-sufficient you are. Or you were trained or you trained yourself to conclude that the goal in life and the sign of being healthy is to not need anybody, to be self-sufficient. Or as a child, you were validated for taking on lots of responsibilities and never having asking for help. You were always helping others. You were super responsible, and that's what got you validation. So now you could not reveal need or weakness. You think people will judge you if you ask for help. They'll think you're incompetent to do things on your own. Or you've convinced yourself that you don't have needs. You've shut down so much internally, you're not even aware of your own needs. Or if you meet somebody and they talk about how tired they are or how busy they are or that they're having a hard day, you then go, okay, I can't ask that person anything. I can't share honestly about what's going on in my life because then I'll be a burden to them. So you shut it down. Now, what's the result of this internally? Is you often feel abandoned. You often feel that nobody really cares for you. Or you grow up and you're more alert to the needs of others than you are to your own needs. You can tell what everybody else in the room needs. You just don't know what you need. Or when you have a need and you need help to get that need met, Instead of admitting it to yourself, what you tell yourself is the only reason you have that need and think you need others is because you're weak, you're lazy, you're just too tired, you're having a bad day. So you can't be honest with yourself that you need others. You explain it in different ways. Finally, you conclude that the reason you have needs is because you're lazy. So, 18 characteristics. How did you do? So if you say, wow, okay, I have this problem, that leads us to the next question. Where did it come from? What caused it? So let me give you a couple things. The first one is it has to do with our parents. And I want to give you 18 characteristics of parents that can produce this fear of being a burden in a child. So number one, you had a narcissistic parent who taught you that you were selfish for asking for anything. And we just talked about that. Or you had a parent who sighed or rolled their eyes whenever you asked for anything. Or you had a parent who was sick or depressed and they couldn't take care of you and you felt like a burden to them. Or you had a workaholic parent who was always stressed out all the time and became exasperated whenever some new situation came up, and that included if you were to ask for anything. Or you had a parent who was so focused on looking good, their image, that negative emotions like a child crying, a child being afraid, a child having a need and expressing it was perceived as weakness. It made them look bad as a parent that they weren't doing their job, so they shamed you and made you feel guilty for crying or showing fear. Or you had a parent who was great with all the other kids in the neighborhood and was, was always spending time doing fun stuff with them, but didn't seem to have time for you. Or you had a parent who parentified you, who relied on you for emotional support instead of relying on their spouse. 
And so now you can't have a problem where you have to rely on them. Or when you ask the parent for something, they made it all about them. They then went, don't you know how busy I am? Don't you know how much many responsibilities I have? Don't you know how difficult my life is? All of a sudden, it became all about them. Or you had a parent who never tried to understand you and your needs, never got you. Or you had a parent who, without you even realizing it, made you feel invisible, wanted you to not have needs, encouraged you, validated you for not having needs. They made you invisible, so you had to be unseen and unheard. Or parents who made a child a hero, and that child always had to be super responsible, could never have needs, but had to meet the needs of others. Or you had a parent that expected you to learn a new skill the first time you attempted it, and you had to do it perfectly the first time. If you didn't, if you failed, if you did a so-so job, they became impatient with you. Or you had a parents that said you only need family. You don't need anybody else. And you shouldn't need anybody else. Or you had parents who taught you, don't tell others about our family problems. We don't air our dirty laundry. So you just keep all those negative things inside of you and never share them with anybody. Or you had a parent who always played the victim, who was always super needy, who was always poor me, oh, I have got a bad headache today, oh, I'm feeling depressed today, oh, I'm feeling so tired today. And you hated having a parent like that and were determined never to be like that. Or if you asked a parent for something or shared that you were struggling, all of a sudden they started crying and they got depressed because they, they would go, I'm such a terrible parent. If I was a good parent, you wouldn't be having all these problems. And they, they just get all down on themselves. Or you grew up with a single parent and you had siblings and your parent, your mom or your dad was so exhausted by the end of the day, they could hardly move off the couch and you never wanted to bother them. Or final one, you had a parent who always had something new they complained about. Some new problem, some new illness, some new stress in their life. So if you had a parent like that, I hope you can see, you would end up feeling like a burden because of what that parent communicated. But then there's some other scenarios that could create this for you as a child. If you had parents who were both playing the victim, a narcissist, an enabler, and you had to try to parent your siblings, you had to parent your, your parents, you had to be the responsible one in the family, then you were caring for everybody else's needs, but you couldn't have needs of your own. Or if you had a family where there's constant fighting, conflict, anger, tension, Often a child thinks the way to help my family is to not have needs. Because when I have needs, it just creates more anger and tension. Or maybe you were a child who was a burden because you had a chronic illness. You were a sick child. And you saw the toll it took on your parents. And you never want to be that to anybody else today. So those all feed into an attitude that says, I never want to be a burden. But what happens if you adopt that attitude? Well, you burn yourself out. You realize we need people. We weren't made to be self-sufficient, totally independent. And so what happens by not putting any of your needs on others, but putting all your needs on yourself, you add to your own burden and you end up burning yourself out. And then that can lead to 
depression. That can lead to a, a deep loneliness, feeling that nobody cares about my life. That can feed shame. Nobody cares about me. I must, I'm not good enough. I'm failing. I'm a loser. And that can take people into just feeling, what's the point? And then it leads to a relapse. So people who are afraid to ask for help and want to try to do it all by themselves often set themselves up to fail. And that can lead to relapse for many. But more than that, one of the reasons we have needs is because it drives us to connect with people. And it's connection with people that is the core piece in being healthy. And so if I try to be independent and never connect with anybody, I can end up with major mental health issues due to that lack of connection. I can end up with physical health issues due to that lack of connection, due to the extra stress I put on myself. So it can lead to mental health. It can lead to physical health issues. It can lead to what somebody has said, the fear of burdening another person has prevented me from letting anyone close to my heart or even into my life. This and the fear of being viewed as a burden. It gets in the way of intimate, healthy relationships. So the consequences can be severe. So let me just kind of develop how important it is to understand we need people. Because so many people from complex trauma come into recovery determined, if I just get enough information, I can do this alone. If I just get enough tools, I can do this alone. But do you realize we can't do it alone? So understand a couple things. Every, organi every organization, every organism is built where we need others. So look at the human body. My nose can't say, I don't need the other parts of my body. My heart can't say, I don't need the other parts of my body. We are built as a body, as an organism, that we need all kinds of different parts to perform their functions. We need that if we're going to be healthy. You look at an organ organization, you need people with different skill sets who can bring different strengths to that organization if that is going to be a healthy, thriving organization. We're designed that we don't have all the skill sets. We need other skill sets. Take that further. In the infancy, we have total dependence. As we move to adulthood, we move out of total dependence, but some people think adulthood should mean total independence, the opposite of total dependence. But what I want you to understand, the healthy design is the infant is totally dependent. Adulthood is healthy interdependence. So I'm not totally dependent, but I'm not totally independent. There's a healthy interdependence. Third, what I just shared about needs, if you think about it, why does a child, a baby, why are they totally dependent? Why do they have so many needs? Why aren't they born with the ability to feed themselves, to walk, to talk? Because needs drive us to connect. And connection is what leads to true happiness. And so needs are actually this ingenious thing that is designed to bring people together so that they can experience the fulfillment of their deepest longing, which is healthy connection, so they can experience joy. So needs are part of that. But then think of Western culture, Western society. We are becoming an increasingly fractured society where we are all about trying to be self-sufficient, where there is not healthy interdependence and connection. And so, because of divorce, rampant, there's fracturing. Because of the ease of travel, 
you don't have the same family and extended family living in the same community anymore. You have people living all over the world from the same family who don't connect more than once a year or once every few years. Used to be that children were raised in a village, they would say. It takes a village to raise a child. But now everybody's off doing their own things. Families are spread all over and children are being raised just by the primary caregiver. There's not that village and extended family anymore to help in the raising of the child. So all those things go together to create this mindset of I got to be strong. I got to do this myself. I can't rely on others because our society is so fractured and families are all over and I'm not close to anybody. And it sets us up to become very unhealthy. So let's move to the healing stuff, the change. So what I don't want you to hear is I need to go out now and tell everybody my needs. I want to start with a caution. You should only tell people about your needs if they are safe people. Because if you tell an unsafe person about your needs, it could be disastrous. It could reinforce all of the things that you heard growing up that made you feel like a burden. So let me say this. A narcissist, if you were to tell them your needs, at first, they would be so caring, so giving. They would be there to help you over and over until it wasn't fun for them anymore. And then they would change on you and then they would start to accuse you of being selfish and it would be disastrous for you. Or you could tell another unsafe, unsafe person your needs and what that for them means is I will help you but you now owe me and you're now in my debt and you don't want that. Or you could tell an unsafe person your needs and what they're hearing is you want me to meet your needs, but now I am going to try and run your life for you. I will be my self-appointed mentor of you and teacher of you, and I will now meddle in your life. So be very careful that you don't choose unsafe people to tell your needs to. But then understand this. You will go to safe people... And for the most part, they will meet your need. And that'll be kind of a new experience for you. But some safe people at times are going to have to say to you, sorry, I can't meet your need today. And you're going to feel all your old stuff triggered. Nobody cares about me. See, I'm a burden to everybody. And it's going to make you want to run and shut down and never ask anybody again. So understand this, when somebody says no or sets a boundary, that's going to trigger your limbic brain. But get out of that into your cortex and go, okay, did they say no because I'm a burden or because they just have too much on their plate right now? Process through it so that you don't go down the old ways in your mind and in your behaviors. Be aware of this of a tendency you might have in yourself. Some people, they're afraid to ask people for help. They're afraid to express their needs because they're afraid people will say no. So what they do is they create a crisis. And everybody comes running. And then they go, see, I didn't need to tell anybody my needs. I just need to create a crisis. And all of a sudden, they're little drama producers, chaos producers, crisis producers. Here's what happens. People come running for a while. But then they catch on to what you're doing and they stop coming. And then you begin to go, okay, that's not working anymore, but I'm still afraid to ask for help. And now if I ask for help, there's going to be a greater probability that they're going to say, sorry, we've got to set a boundary with you because you've caused so much drama in our life. We're not going to go there. And so you could create what you're trying to avoid. Now let me just switch to, let's say somebody comes to you and asks for help. There's a couple things you need to be aware of. So the first thing is, think of it 
from the perspective of parenting. If my one-year-old asked me to help feed them soup, I do it because they're not yet capable of, of feeding themselves, of meeting that need. If my 20-year-old asked me to feed them their soup, I go, no, there's something wrong here. So what I'm doing with that one-year-old is, yes, I'm meeting that need for them, but I'm also teaching them the tools so that they learn how to feed themselves so they eventually can feed themselves and not need me for that need anymore. And so what you understand as a parent is child has many needs, but you teach them tools so that they can meet more and more needs on their own, but you help them also recognize there's still going to be some needs, even as an adult, they'll need others for help. So as I work with people, I want to ask, where are they at in their growth? Are they still kind of infant when it comes to their toolbox and their abilities? Or do they have the tools to feed themselves? So that leads to a question. If I help somebody who's still at an infant and doesn't have the tools, they need my help. That's a good thing to do. But if I help somebody who has tools but is just not wanting to use them or is lazy, I would not be loving by doing it for them. I would be enabling them to not grow up, to remain stuck where they're at in their immaturity. So when people come and ask me for help, I need to be able to ask, where are they at? Can they do it for themselves? Do they have a to the tools? If not, then I will help them. If they do, I shouldn't help them, but kind of pressure them to use the tools that they have. The next thing that I ask is, as I've gotten to know this person, do they implement tools as they learn them? Or do they just, imp do they just acquire tools as academic knowledge, but never implement them? And some people do that. And they're afraid to try and implement them because they're afraid they won't do it perfectly the first time. They're afraid they're going to fail. So they like learning about tools. They're just afraid to implement them. If I see that, then I know I would not be doing a favor to them by doing it for them. I need to resist doing it for them and pressure them to do it themselves. Another thing that I ask sometimes when people come and ask for help with their needs is, okay, this need that they have, is it because they're just lazy? Is it because they keep procrastinating on all their responsibilities? So if I help them, am I going to be reinforcing laziness, procrastination? Those are things I have to consider as well. Another thing that often happens is people have such a great fear of making the wrong decision that they come to me and they want me to help them think through decisions. And I, I do that. Here's the pros. Here's the cons. And, and that's an important part for them learning how to think and learning how to weigh out different options. And I don't mind doing that. But some will keep coming to me whenever they have any decision that they need to make. And I begin to realize they want me to make their decision for them. Because they're afraid that if they make the decision, they might make a mistake. But if I make it, there's a greater chance they won't make a mistake. And I go, they're dependent on me to do their thinking for them. That's not healthy. And I need to be aware of that. Some people, they come to me wanting help and I give them help. And then they just heap me with praise. They validate me over and over. And I begin to realize with some, they came to me for help. But what they're doing now is more than just appreciation. It's not even appreciation. They're now playing me. They're now trying to pad my ego, build me up so that they can manipulate me, so that I'll like them, so that I'll look up to them. And that's not healthy either. So there's a bunch of different things that are important for you to be aware of when people come and ask for help. Okay, so let's wrap up. How do we grow in this area? So again, it's being aware that I need to approach safe people, 
But then, when you have a need, and you're aware that you have a need, assess, okay, what is my responsibility when it comes to meeting this need? And you might find out, I, I, I'm 100% responsible to feed myself. I can't go and ask others to feed me. Um, or, I, you know what, I need to be a parent to my children. And I, I'm a single mom. And I'm 90%. I got to be there consistently for my kids. But I need a break sometimes. I need people to help me. So I can't 100% meet that need without burning out. So I need to begin to look for people who could meet that need. And that's where it gets tricky because some people, they just run back to their biological family and say, can you take care of the kids today? But their biological family is very unhealthy and they get hurt every time and the children are getting unhealthy stuff passed on to them. But they don't take the time to build new relationships. They're afraid to ask people outside the family for help. And so they keep running back to their own family and they keep getting hurt. And so you have to be prepared to move out of your comfort zone, to move out of what's easy to do and do some hard things and ask people for help when everything in you is afraid to do that. You have to go through fear, you have to go through discomfort, and you have to move out of your comfort zone. But then retrain your conscience so that what you've had before is Asking others for help, you feel guilty. Now you have to go, it's all right to ask people for help. So I ask people for help, but I'm still going to feel guilty. But I, that's my limbic brain. That's the old stuff. I can push past that. And the more you push past that and you keep asking for help in healthy ways, your conscience gets retrained and it doesn't bother you anymore. Now let me give you just this thing to think about. For a child in complex trauma, expressing a need and asking for help usually resulted in being told you're selfish, you were humiliated, you were shamed. And so part of what was going on there, dynamics-wise, is not just was your need not met, but you went through the emotional pain of humiliation. Here's what I want you to understand. Now... To express a need means you have to humble yourself. And that's scary for a person from complex trauma because I have to be vulnerable. I have to admit I have a need. I have to go to somebody. Humbling myself makes me afraid they're going to humiliate me. But understand this. When you humble yourself and go to your uh, safe person, they will never humiliate you. Your humility will not result in humiliation, but only if you have safe people. So there's two very important pieces here in getting our needs met. Both parties become involved. I need humility, but I need safe people. And when you put the two together, then you get your needs met in a healthy way. And then continue to deal with the shame that came out of feeling like a burden, feeling like you weren't good enough. And again, we see over and over again that this shame piece is such a huge part of our healing journey. Continue to work on that. It is all part of the process. Okay, that's the end of part one. We're going to take a short break. Then I'll come back and do a Christian part. If that doesn't interest you, no problem. You're free to go. We'll see you next week to everybody else. I'll be back in just a minute. Well, welcome back. We started a couple of weeks ago a study of the life of 
one of my favorite Bible characters, Joseph. He's known for saving the world and Israel from this famine that took place many years ago. But what I want us to understand is Joseph experienced a tremendous amount of trauma, both within his family and outside of his family. And last two weeks, we've been looking at kind of the unhealthy stuff within his family. There was a lot of sick stuff going on there. Today, I want you to see the, the main traumas that came out of his family. And it is quite heartbreaking, and many of you will have experienced it. But let me start with the very first things we read about Joseph. It says this in Genesis 37. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bella and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some, some of the bad things his brothers were doing. So the very first record we're given of Joseph saying something He's ratting out his brothers. He's telling his dad what they're doing when they're way off in the distance taking care of the sheep. And it's some very bad stuff. Now, some people look at this and and see Joseph in a negative light. He's, He's a rat, a tattletale. But I think the reason we're told this about Joseph is to show that, no, this isn't a weakness in Joseph. This is a strength. Joseph, from a young boy, has a character that says, I want what is right. I want to love people. I want to treat people properly with respect. And when I see my brothers hurting people, doing things that are wrong, I want to stop that. And so we see that from a young boy, despite the fact he grew up in a family where there's all kinds of sexual perversion, where there's all kinds of anger, hatred, hurting each other, Joseph as a young boy says, I want to live by love. I want to do what is right. And so we see this amazing young man developing who's committed to living by God's design, to live by a healthy standard. It's a beautiful thing to see. But then we get this. Because of what Joseph did, and then a couple other things that we're going to see now, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. His father favors him over the other children. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. So for some of you growing up in Sunday school, this was referred to as the coat of many colors. We don't know for sure what the, the Hebrew word means in referring to this robe, but there's basically two things that seem clear. By Joseph wearing this robe that his father gave him, what Jacob was saying was, number one, Joseph, you don't have to work like your brothers. You don't have to work as hard. Number two, you're going to get the main part of the inheritance, even though you're one of the youngest of the children. You're going to get special treatment. So what happens? His brothers hated Joseph. Because their father loved him more than them. So they respond out of anger and hatred to Joseph, this favorite, this pet. They couldn't say a single kind word to him. So Joseph is bullied. Joseph is constantly having his brothers take shots at him, say hurtful things to him. Beat him up. Do other hurtful things to him. He is constantly being bullied and put down. A very, very difficult thing for a young boy to grow up in, and many of you have grown up in it. And then we're told this. One night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. So what is this dream? 
He says, listen to this dream, he said. We were on the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up. And your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before me. In other words, Joseph is saying, one day you guys are going to bow before me. Now, I think what Joseph is trying to do here is say, brothers, it's right that dad's favoring me because I will someday be over you. I will someday rule you. Someday you will admire me and bow before me out of reverence. I think he's trying to help them get over their hatred, help them to accept his favored positions. But we're told his brothers hated him all the more. And they respond, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams. And he had a second dream and he told them about it. And by the way, he talked about them. Soon Joseph had another dream, and again he told his brothers and about it, and he listened, I had another dream. And the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed low before me. So Joseph is making things worse when he's trying to make them better. Joseph is feeding into his brother's hatred of him. So here's what I want you to think about, and many of you can relate to what Joseph went through. He didn't just have one sibling that was bullying him, that hated him. He had 10 older brothers who all hated him, who bullied him, who beat him up, who said every hurtful thing they could say. He was bombarded with it day after day, 24-7. And then he had three other mothers that didn't like him. Three stepmoms who hated him as well, who shunned him. Can you imagine growing up in that, not feeling you belong, not feeling love, living in constant danger and fear? And then more than that, his own mother's dead. He can't go to her for comfort. And if he goes to his dad and his dad comforts him, that'll just make his brother's anger worse. And why doesn't his dad stop it? Joseph is hurting big time. And so this kid is traumatized in mega ways. You can just again feel the depression, the sadness, the frustration, the hurt, the pain. All that Joseph went through. So here again is a young man growing up with a sick family, growing up being severely abused by that family, but still saying, I want to follow God. I want to be healthy. I don't want to adopt the same hatred that my brothers have to me. I want to be free of hatred. I want to have love. And in the weeks ahead, we're going to look at what enabled Joseph to be this this young man. And then it continued, and he was that as an adult as well. And I just hope it encourages you that, okay, I can choose a different way. I can choose to be healthy. I can heal from all of these wounds that are very similar to Joseph's. And I can grow to become a healthy person. Let's pray. Father, again, we're just grateful for this story in the Bible that somebody who is very, very godly isn't that because they had an easy life, isn't that because everything was perfect for them, but they chose to be that in light of a very painful life where everything was against them. And just help us to do the same. Amen. Well, that's our Friday. Thank you again for being with us.